everyone. My name is Hannah with Chai and Parche, and I am doing a presentation on Iran, the Silk Road, Hamadan, and why it all is so special. Uh, my father is from Hamadan, and um, a lot of my family still lives there. And when I learned that it was a major stop along the Silk Road, I decided that I needed to do a presentation on it. Um, yes, I am a historical customer. Um, this presentation does include some information on textiles and a Safavid era outfit, um, but most of it is about some information on Iran, the Silk Road, and um, a lot of information about Hamadan and some of the monuments um, and things that exist to this day. So here we go. This is a map of the Persian Empire over the de centuries, really. Um, it has expanded and shrunk, and where it says Iran is what we have as modern day Iran. Um, here is an overview of Iran and the Silk Road. It is not actually a road. It is a multitude of routes that extend from east to west. Um, it started in Huang City, China, passed through Central Asia, uh, north of Iran, and ended in Syria along the sea. It was incredibly important to the Sassanid um, era Persians because of um, their point on the Silk Road, they had a really strong position and it kind of enabled them to charge custom duties and taxes uh, to all of the caravans traveling through the countryside. So a really important part of the Persian Silk Road are the uh, caravan Sarai, um, I apologize. Uh, I have a not great grasp on language. <laughs> um, these are basically roadside inns and are one of the most important aspects of the route along the Silk Road because this was between 12 and 20 miles apart and it allowed travelers um, to stop and rest and replenish. And they are still in existence to this day. A lot of them are. And some of them you can even stay in. Um, uh, quite a few of them that they used over the centuries, like I said, are still in existence and are recognized as heritage sites. Um, I'm going to move myself real quick. So one of the really cool parts of the Silk Road is that there is actually a Persian Royal Road as well. Um, it took 90 days to complete by foot or caravan. It took up to a week to complete by horseback by the emissaries who were traveling at speed. Um, it's 1,500 miles long from the Persian city of Susa to the um, Aegean Sea. One of the things that um, Iran or Persia exported was carpets, precious metals, stones, gems, fabrics, and spices, though they also imported a lot of fabrics from China. Um, one of the interesting things that I learned through this research is that Persia came to um, control the spice route because I didn't know that we were actually a seafaring folk, um, but apparently we came to control the spice route, especially via sea route, because during... Um, over the centuries, there have been a lot of wars that happened. So um, because Iran, I'm sorry, Persia was um, traveling from India, China, they were able to continue trading 
via these routes over the sea. So now we're going to get into the history of Hamadan. And I would also like to note that um, there are several ways to spell Hamadan. Sometimes it's with an E. Um, Persian language, Farsi, is phonetically spelled. So there are often many different ways to spell things. Um, I choose to use the A um, in Hamadan instead of Hamadan, where it would have an E. So Hamadan has had several different names. Um, it was known as Egmatane or Ekbatana, which meant place of gathering. Um, over the years, the name changed and I have tried to kind of pinpoint exactly when that name change happened, but it was really difficult to find and there was no clear indication of when about that changed, though, um, it kind of sounds like it was about when the um, Achaemenid Empire fell. Um, Hamadan is believed to be one of the oldest cities in Iran and possibly even the world. Um, it has been around for a very, very, very long time. Um, it may have been founded by the Medes or Assyrians around 11,000 BC, although that date is of course debated, as are a lot of dates, since it's really difficult to find information about when things actually existed. Um, Hamadan has managed to maintain its status as a metropolitan trading point and economic center uh, mostly because of its place along the Silk Road, as well as the good weather that it has during the summer months. Um, Iran can get extremely hot, and because of the altitude of the mountain ranges, um, it maintains an incredibly gorgeous weather during the summer. So um, because of Iran's um, status along the Silk Road, it has been known as Iran's warehouse. It has also been dubbed the center of Persian culture and civilization as it's an incredibly old city that still remains today. Um, it has been invaded, ruined, returned to the Persians multiple times over the centuries and it is still standing. However, because it has been um, invaded, ruined, and returned so many times, there is actually very little of the city that still remains today um, from history. And some relics have been found, um, but a lot of it is very small items. So we'll learn a little bit about that. Um, some of the really cool things about Hamadan is the rugs. I found a book called um, One Woman, One Weft, and it is all about the rugs from Hamadan. Um, it is the largest retailer of modestly priced rugs. And one of the interesting things that I learned about that is most of the rugs used to actually come from the villages around Hamadan, not Hamadan itself, but the villages around it. Um, and this is important a little bit later on because um, we'll hear about that. So any Persian rug that is not finely woven is considered a Hamadan rug. Um, Hamadan didn't used to actually weave carpets. Uh, they were more into the like handicrafts. They were known for their leather, um, pottery, kilim, ceramics. Um, they are actually a really heavily agricultural um, community. Over 50% of the region is used for agriculture um, from dry farming to orchards. Um, so one of the cool facts about the weaving that I was going to say is the 
rugs are almost all made, were almost all made during the winter months. And that is because the winter months are longer and a lot of the women would stay home and weave the rugs during these winter months because they didn't, weren't working on any of the agricultural aspects. Um, so most of the villages um, will usually, or like, you know, cities would have workshops set up for the rugs to be made, or it would kind of have like um, one woman who would be overseeing a few women working on rugs, but that's not how it was in the villages around Hamadan. They would actually just be making them in their homes on small looms. Um, they didn't receive any of the money for their rugs until they actually sold. And they would sell them after the winter time, usually before the spring equinox. Um, and they would usually sell between one and two rugs. If the woman was really industrious, they would be able to weave up to two rugs. And they are usually known as scatter sized because, um, and that just means that they're kind of small and ideal for like decoration or, you know, area rugs, like little small area rugs. Um, and that's probably because they needed to have time to finish them, you know, before the spring planting and the spring equinox, um, they needed to be able to sell them at market. And um, that's what people wanted. That was a market demand. Uh, some of the ways that these rugs are identified is on their uncomplicated geometric designs. They're like straightforward peasant designs, the Harati or Mavi designs, and some Western inspired floral designs. So the yarn that was you used to be used was all hand spun, good quality yarn, wool yarn. Nowadays, they use industry yarn um, and less elaborate colors are used. It used to be that the colors were like reds and blues and were absolutely vibrant. Um, they were traditionally made from indigo, um, dyer crab, those kind of things. Synthetic dyes, even when they were created, were actually banned from Iran up and through like World War II because it was kind of recognized that they didn't want to use synthetic dyes. They wanted to use like natural uh, materials. So nowadays they do use synthetic dyes. They use poor quality um, machine spun yarn and the looks nowadays are kind of like chemically washed and just over painted rugs. Um, the rugs from the Hamadan region are usually single wefted, woven with a symmetrical knot. This kind of creates an exposure of the warp um, and it is easier to see uh, on coarse, heavier wefted rugs. So a lot of people don't like rugs from the Hamadan region. They think that they're ugly. Um, when I spoke with my father about this, he kind of laughed and was like, yeah, people don't like want to buy the rugs from the Hamadan region. They're, you know, not the best. But um, I, I actually think that they're, you know, quite beautiful. I mean, I love the simplistic look of them. They're great for your home in areas that, you know, are going to get a lot of traffic. So... So what is Hamadan known for? Um, it actually has a hugely rich history for being such a small province um, because it is so old. It has a chapter in history for every, no, it has an existence in every single chapter of history for Iran. Um, it's been a capital city. It has been the cross on the cross-continental trade route. Um, it is the birthplace of poets, 
um, the resting place of scientists, et cetera. Um, so there has been like, there is so much history in Hamadan. Um, it's known for poetry, the knowledge, art, they can all be found here. Um, while now modern Hamadan is becoming more industrious, um, there is a, a lot of factories being put out, um, a lot of workshops for rug making. Um, the only exception is the countryside. It is still as gorgeous as it used to be. So what is Hamadan known for? And now we're gonna get into some of the monuments um, and other things on, around the town. So Baba Tahir was a poet who was born in Hamadan in the 11th century. He still has a tomb and is buried with his companion, Fatima, um, and you can visit it today. That is a um, image of what the tomb looks like from the outside. It's beautiful. Um, he is known for his Dobaitis, um, a Persian poem of four lines, and I apologize for my pronunciation again. Um, even though I have been around Farsi my whole life, pronunciation is not my strong suit. So here is one of the poems that he wrote. As an example, when trees to grow beyond their boundaries dare, they cause the gardeners much anxious care. Down to their very roots they must be pruned, though pearls and rubies be the fruits they bear. It's really simple, really beautiful. Um, he was known as a mystic and um, you can find books of his poetry to this day. So Esther and Mordecai are presumed to be buried in Hamadan. Um, she was a biblical Jewish queen who married a Persian king. Um, and her uncle is said to be buried next to her. So this one was uh, very interesting to learn about, and I did not know about this history. It is an incredibly important pilgrimage site for Iranian Jews. It is practically the only heritage, you know, holy place in Iran for Jewish people. Um, while there is no mention of it in Jewish texts, um, it is kind of strictly an Iranian tradition. They can make a pilgrimage to the tomb year round, but they especially do it during the Jewish holiday Purim. Um, the date of the shrine's construction is unknown, but it was supposedly destroyed centuries ago and then rebuilt. Uh, and that's just based on kind of the dating of the architecture. Um, Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, um, is a really cool one that I learned about. I've known about him for a while. He was an extremely well-known mathematician, physician, scientist, and philosopher. He wrote hundreds of texts um, on philosophy, medicine. Uh, my stepmom is a doctor, and she's actually been really interested in his works. Um, because his works were actually, his medical texts were being used all the way through like the 17th century. So um, it's pretty cool. Only about 250 of his 450 um, texts are known to be in existence to this day. Uh, even though he was not born in Hamadan, he was born in Bukhara, he is buried in Hamadan. Um, where there is a mausoleum that you can visit. Uh, the Ganjname inscriptions are an incredibly old inscriptions that are um, carved into the uh, face of Mount Olivand, which is southwest of Hamadan. They were carved during the um, Achaemenid period and for years, people thought that the inscriptions were basically um, directions for treasure. So they called it 
treasure book, which is what Ganjaname stands for. There, there are two trilingual inscriptions. One was written by Darius the Great and one by his son Xerxes. They are in Old Persian, Babylonian, and Elamite. Uh, they carry praise to Ahura Mazda, who is a Zoroastrian um, religious figure. Uh, lineages, conquests, along with a prayer for the preservation of the company, uh, country. Here is some of the translation. Um, this one is by Darius. A great God is Ahura Mazda who created this earth, who created yonder heaven, who created men, who created happiness for man, who made Darius king, one king for many, one Lord for all. Uh, the two sides are practically identical. There's just um, some changes to the lineages and the king because Dar um, Darius did one and Xerxes did the other. The pass where the tabloids are written um, used to be the main passage from the east to west through the mountains because the uh, city of Hamadan used to be the capital city for the summer during the Achaemenid period. Um, this beautiful structure is called Gombade Alavion, um, or the Alavion Dome. It was built during the Islamic era in Hamadan and is now listed as a um, Iranian national monument due to its history um, and everything that is on the building. Um, it's kind of debated exactly what it was built for, um, but it was built around the Seljuk dynasty, the 10th to 12th century. Um, they're not entirely sure what the original purpose was. There's two versions of the story. Um, it could have been built as a mosque and then converted into a monastery and then a family tomb for the house of um, Alavion. Or um, it, it said that it was originally built as a monastery and later was used as the burial place because the two senior men members of the um, Alavion family are buried in the tombs in the cellar. Um, originally, the structure had a massive green dome on the top, which as you can see, it is missing now, but over the years, it collapsed. Um, what makes this so rich in history is the stucco inscriptions, which have Quranic inscriptions, um, Kufi calligraphy, um, patterns, flower motifs all along the insides and the structure of the doors. Um, and it is hugely cultural and important. So they wanna preserve it. This is a favorite of mine. Um, I have actually visited Iran, visited Iran several times, and um, the Ali Sadr Sa uh, caves are incredible. Um, I have been able to visit these caves. So they are the world's largest underground water cave. And you can actually take boat tours to go through it. Um, there is electricity, so they kind of light up all of the um, stalactites and stalagmites um, that are present. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, you enter, you go down through um, a series of stairs. There's a wharf where you can um, get on the boats and there's a bunch of different routes, but they all end in the massive open area called the island. Um, and one of the really cool things is they have actually found evidence that humans have been living here um, like up to like 12,000 years ago. They found historic tools, works of art, um, like jugs, pitchers, paintings of deer, hunting scenes, bows and arrows, like um, 
it's all evidence that people have been in these caves for thousands of years. Um, one of the other things that kind of shows that people have been around in Hamadan for centuries is Hegmatane Hill. Um, Iran is actually looking to have Hegmatane Hill registered on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, it is a 30 acre mound that um, is the largest one in Iran. It is extremely scenic and you can see some really great views of the mountains and cities. Uh, you can actually visit this archeological site. Um, there are walkways all around the outside. It's like really rickety planks. Um, I have visited this site. Um, I had no idea what it was when I actually went like what, 15 years ago. Um, but researching it now, I'm like, oh yeah, I've actually been there. And I had no idea like the importance of it back then. But like now that I'm learning about it now, it was really cool to know that I've actually been able to like visit this site. Um, and there is a museum. So you can see some of the artifacts that they found like pottery, metal, um, stone items. Um, the most important finds of this are the um, they were able to identify kind of the all the units, um, irrigation systems, and the passages. They aren't entirely sure what it is, but they believe that it might be the ancient capital city of uh, Medes. And if you want to know like how old they think it might be, like. They think it might be founded in 678 BC, but it's been mentioned at least all the way back to like the fourth century. So the earliest excavations started in 1913, but the most, um, with the excavations happened the most during the 1980s to 2000. That's when they found the majority of the stuff. Um, so some of the artifacts that they found are in the museum. Some are in the um, National Museum of Iran and others are scattered across the world um, in private collections or museums like the Met um, or some in Germany. So this is, you know, probably the one most close to my heart right now is the food because with everything that's happening in Iran, I am still able to make the food um, and connect with my culture. So Ashaberenj or rice soup is made with cooked rice, herbs, lentils, ground beef, tomatoes, and spices. And it is an incredible dish for the winter time. Um, and it's also a really good use of any leftover rice. Uh, so I was speaking with my father about, you know, things about Hamadan because he grew up there and I wanted to know if there was anything special that he remembered. And he was like, well, you know, that kebab that I make in the pan. Uh, and I was like, yeah, he was like, well, that's something that you don't find in a lot of other places. It's like kind of special to Hamadan and it's basically ground meat um, that you cook in a pan with tomato and egg. And so he told me what it is like in Hamadan. And so it's usually made specifically for picnics. Um, the butcher would make it, he sells it, and then the people would take it to the baker to cook in their ovens when they would also get the bread and then they would bring it on picnics. Um, my favorite though is Dizzy or Abgusht. Um, it is named after the traditional stone or pot that it is cooked in. It is also served in the pot. Um, the main ingredients are usually either lamb or beef, although we usually cook it with lamb, uh, tomato, potato, onion, chickpeas, um, or also lentils and different types of spices. Um, what you usually do 
is you separate the broth into one bowl and all of the goodies like the uh, lamb and chickpeas and potato into another. You take the broth, you tear slices of sangak bread um, and you let that kind of sit for a couple of minutes while the juices um, all get absorbed into the bread. And then you eat that as kind of a side dish. And then you take up all of the other things in the bowl, like with the meat and potatoes, and you mash all that up together. And then you serve that with sangak bread and herbs um, and some pickled um, vegetables as well. And it is absolutely delicious and extremely traditional. One of the really cool things about Iran as a whole are the bazaars. So the one in Hamadan, the current building that it is housed in actually dates to the Qajar and Pahlavi era. Um, it is really, all of the um, rows are kind of open except for the one that goes to the um, Jame Mosque, which was built during the Qajar era. Um, it is so famous that it has actually been mentioned in several writings all the way back to the fourth century AD. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Hamadan is really famous for its animal skins, tanning of animal skins and leather goods. Um, so each row of a bazaar in general is comprised of made, dedicated mainly to one particular profession or trade. In Hamadan, the bazaar is um, comprised of about 30 rows of shops. Um, some rows nowadays have lost, um, you know, being dedicated to one primary profession or trade, mostly because some have gone out of fashion while others are um, more popular. So some rows are have more intermingling in them. So here is my little costuming bit. Um, I do costume in Persian outfits, uh, especially for Society for Creative Anachronism. I um, am wearing a Safavid era costume here, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So the first layer is called the Pirahan. It is the layer closest to the skin. It's kind of like a chemise. The second layer is a Ziri, ka ziri Kaba. Um, and it's the coat that you wear over the pirahan. It's usually a long sleeve. The outer layer is the rui kaba. Um, it's often short sleeved. Um, it can be long sleeved as well. And you can do multiple layers of this. The pants are shalvar, which a really cool detail is I am wearing them with naqshe, which is about the bottom two thirds or so of the shalvar. And um, in vintage historical antique clothing, um, there are some existing um, extant replicas or garments of this, and they are almost all made on a diagonal stripe. So I managed to find some fabric that was made with a diagonal stripe. So this is actually historically accurate. I did not have to cut it on the bias to get the stripe. Um, so the shoes are either leather or fabric and they're kind of like flats with a slightly pointed toe. Um, occasionally they'll have a heel. And for the headwear, I am wearing a triangle hat um, that's made out of fabric and it is secured to a veil with veil pins. I found most of my fabric, um, I actually find using Indian fabric stores, either online or um, in stores around me. So this one is my um, Rui Cabal is from um, Itokri. And I'm wearing a gold linen Pirahan and a wool Ziri Cabal. So Iran is currently going through a revolution. 
and I can't do a presentation on Iran without um, saying something. So I am going to read a poem by Pardis uh, about what is happening in Iran and what we hope to happen. Mosen and Masa, the son and daughter of Iran, the dictatorship mercilessly took you from us, and the Vatan, in your grace, we will water your graves with their blood. This debt will be paid back. Someday soon you will be sitting in your cells, justice levying its final attack. Iran is farce, is Kurd, is Arab, is Turk, is Balak. Iran is woman, is man, is non-binary, gender diverse. Iran is straight love and queer love and love above all. Iran is the flower that blooms from frost with roots fed by war. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation.